So the walk through time has a, a number of goals and I'll, I'll go through briefly as I understand most of you have looked at this already, but the important one here is the expose visitors and students to the awe-inspiring scale of geological and biological deep time. Those were concepts that are very difficult for us in the beginning. How does one even try to portray 4.58 billion years in the landscape, much less a small of area of landscape as we have? So that really was the nut that we've, we've struggled with to crack. And it's where the design really got interesting for us. The last one there, representing UBC's prominence in the natural sciences education and research, that's both a, at a local scale when guests and visitors and students and faculty walk across campus, but it's also about elevating the school's prominence at a more global scale, using this as an Instagram moment and something that can be promoted across the different science departments in other schools and other parts of the world so that the, the prominence of the, our campus here really stands out and people, students particularly understand this is the place to be to go for these programs. Where we landed after many, 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 many iterations and many different sessions with different groups, each one I was learning something new, um, we've landed on what we call the ribbon and the ripple. So the ribbon, which goes in front of ESB and connects to the PME, is the predominant element, it is describing both uh, geological and biological time, and it's the measure stick. Whereas the ripple in front of the BD is more exploratory around the biological side because of the context with the, the museum there. They have different expressions in terms of linear versus radial, but in order to connect these pieces, to the passerby and to people being guided on tours, we have um, really clung to and decided upon the materials and the form being the connector. Because we are unable to do a physical or visual one across Main Mall, there are those pieces are how people understand these elements are related to each other. And we hope that people discover them by accident as well as on purpose and it's meant to evoke curiosity. Touching very lightly on all of the geological events, the 15 of them that we're showing here were selected by the user group and the faculty and they represent some of the key moments in the development of our planet. At the PME by number 15 there, sort of the beginning and end depending on which direction you start from, that's really where the earth and the moon come into being. And at the other end, number one, that's more or less where we are now. Um, geological events are much more linear in that they carry over millions and millions of years. Whereas the biological events, the 10 that we're showing here, are far more short in their span. So we're able to identify those as moments in time rather than spans in time. There are many different um, options within the biological storyline to choose from, but the user group has picked these as the most critical in terms of leading to the biodiversity that we have on our planet now and tying into the um, material that the BD has in their displays. At a sort of angled bird's eye, the formation of the earth on the left was it, <clears throat> which is at the PME door. The formation of the moon almost coincides with where that existing um, sphere of the Earth's crust exists. It's a little bit off the timeline, but we've been able to rationalize that with the user group. As you can imagine, being science faculty, they are um, infinitely concerned with accuracy and detail. So the placements of all these elements has been and continues to be worked out in close co collaboration with them. The first biological event there on the bottom of the screen is something we've been using the metaphor of heart. It's the heartbeat of the planet, it's the first bump in that uh, curve like we'd see on a heart rate monitor, and that's the beginning of life. And so it's this moment of popping up in the otherwise sort of what they call the boring billion um, where not a whole lot was happening. 
as you round the corner of ESB, you can see how they increase in frequency. So that heartbeat, the life on the planet is now becoming more rapid, more regular, and life is really teeming by the time we get to today in the Anthropocene. We need to show the biological and the geological because those sciences are fundamentally related to each other. They create each other in a way, predominantly geological leading biological, but there's a, a relationship and symbiosis in there that um, the ribbon needs to express. So at 140 meters long, that's our 4.5 billion years. We've broken that down that 3.2 meters is 100 million years. And that 3.2, um, thanks to the persistence of Dean, is the piece that relates strongest to the building architecture. The 100 million years is half the distance between the big columns on the building. So the building itself becomes an element of the timeline that you can see that span is actually 200 million years. So there's a strong relationship there. and we're really excited that the math allowed us to continue to have that relationship. Hopefully you can see my cursor there. So there's the, the building column and there's a plate here. That's the relationship that we're able to achieve. There's another one and so those are marking time. Geological events are shown on the ground plane and the extrusions are where we talk about the biological events. In terms of another piece of science that we got to learn about, there's something called the geologic time scale. This is a, a recognized around the world uh, color codification of how to describe where we are in the geological time scale of our planet. And we're using that color as a means to gain excitement and to provide a little bit of visual interest to the casual passerby. But it also speaks to the scientists in the group who really want to see where in there. And you could show them while we're in the pink, okay, we're in Precambrian. Green, oh, we know we're in Cretaceous. This is the type of information that they'll share with tour groups, the children, uh, the K to 12 group that we're going to be seeing a lot of coming out to this piece. And it just gets a little bit of that punch in color that the first iteration had a lot of, and we are far more understated in this version. Beginnings and ends are always interesting topics. Um, the end of one thing is always the beginning of something else. Our planet came at 4.5 billion years ago through the destruction of other pieces and the formation of gases and all sorts of things as a landscape architect I don't truly understand. But there's time before that, it's just not ours. So the dashes in front of our timeline represent something came before the moment we're talking about. And if you walk around the building and you go to the other side in the north, where we are today at 0, 0.00, there are more dashes. Those represent time continuous beyond where we are now. And just like we don't really know what came before us, we don't know what's in front of us either. So it's a bit of a metaphor there to, uh, again, invoke curiosity. It also allows you to start and end the ribbon based on where your interests are or where you have been. If you're at BD, you can start and end at the PME. If you're at the PME, you can start there at the formation, go up to the biological, and then cross. So the, uh, the content of the material actually relates quite well to the physical locations of each of those museums. Getting a little bit more into the details, the idea here is that um, each end would have an uh, identifier on how to use this piece. Uh, there'd be a donor plaque, of course, recognizing um, the Wheaton group. Those are being worked out now in terms of content with the uh, naming committee. And the sign pieces there in the end are sort of the, the start of this event and our current event on the right hand side. You can see the uh, suggestion of the, call, the extrusion here. Of course, at the PME, we don't have one nearly so close, but just for reference. And it repeats on the other end, on the far end of Earth Sciences, you can see in the top where that red box is. So there's a strong repetition to this, suggesting the non-linear portion of a linear timeline. Perforated letters, things that we're working out uh, now in detail, are um, what language needs to be included on this so that everyone can understand it and that it's a, a successful teaching tool. For a little bit of scale, we've drawn a person in there 
to show that the sign board or the entry point is <clears throat> about four feet tall. It means people, even if they're on their phone, hopefully don't walk into it. And that one point or point one five meters represents the measurement plaques that we're using along the way. And then the extrusions at 0.75 tall, taller than most people want to use as a sitting point. We, if people sit, it won't fall over, but it's not something we're inviting to be site furniture. There's lots of great benches on campus. Um, we're not inviting people to use these directly as that. The ribbon, if I start on the left, there will be plaques that identify a particular moment. In this case, we're looking at the Huronian snowball event, which is quite early in our Earth's history. And that linear piece there would continue for the length of time represented on the timeline relative to the actual time it took. So it starts here at 2.3 million billion years ago, and it would extend all the way to the left till that period is over. A similar marker would be on the other end, so depending the direction you come, you know what geological event you're looking at. In the extrusion, which you can see in section down here, has uh, the dates on it, and it also has a plaque. In this case, we're talking about oxygenation, the thing that is why we're all here, and the content is still being developed with our content person, um, but it would be a plaque inset into the extrusion. Within, you can see there's a colored sort of form. We're describing that as the emerging biodiversity of life. We used to call it the chaos of life, but it's, and while life is chaotic, it's really the biodiversity that is emerging. We'll speak to that one a little bit more. And then at the top, you can see that color inlay representing the GTS. So that color would range and create grade into other colors as you travel along it. The core 10 band is going to be inset flush with the concrete. Um, we're going over the technical details with that now relative to thermal mass expansion and all those fun crunchy details. So there's no trip hazard um, as a walking surface. It will be treated so that it's a non-slip through sandblasting. It's only the tall and hopefully very colorful um, chaos elements or the heartbeat of the planet that are the vertical elements people would see. In a little bit more detail, the, the metal insert there is like an origami. The in the first moment where we have oxygen formation, that sleeve would have one simple fold in it and it would have one simple LED light that represents the simplicity of life at that moment in time. As those heartbeats move along, you begin to see the complexity. We're using oxygen, which is the first, and the guts of more or less the last one. That complexity evolves, representing the diversity and biodiversity of life, as well as the chaos, that given the environment we all live in now. And the light increases, the amount of LED lights within that increases to the end. So you can see this in the evenings, which isn't a lot of the campus life in the fall and the spring and the winter. Your curiosity is brought forward by seeing an emerging amount of light. Why is it very bright here? Why is there not a whole lot over there? Going to take a look at that during the day. That's what we're trying to invoke in everyone who passes by. Just a spark of curiosity that says, hmm, what's that about? In the same way that works within the scientific community. I wonder what that star is up in the sky. Well, let's explore that. That's, that's really the essence of what we're trying to achieve. Um, just a few more notes on there. As you see in this slide, the biodiversity sleeve or the chaos of life is color coordinated to the geological time scale so that we aren't trying to introduce yet another color or yet another material. There's a, a strong uniformity and linearness to how those colors are represented. And during the daytime and in the evening, you would see that color shift. And again, really invoking that curiosity. The ripple is um, something that came along a little bit later in uh, response to the sandbox we were allowed to play in. Initially, there was a physical and visual connection between the two museums, but knowing that we could not go through that sacred space in the middle, 
we needed to create something at the BD entrance that evoked the same curiosity that provided the visual connection in place of the physical that we had originally looked at. And the storyline here is uh, predominantly around the burst of biodiversity. This is under uh, development in further detail with the faculty and user group from the BD side. Um, there's a level of complexity and distillation that we need to explore with them still. But essentially, the color bands here are the same colors that they use within the museum. So if you wanted to understand about the tetrapods, this brown color is exactly the same one you'd see inside of the uh, displays. Entomology, the purple there, relates to that band of life, that group of biodiversity. Essentially, this form came from the tree of life, which is a very complex form and where we're exploring now. And this was our first attempt at distillation. So each of these different curved radiuses or curved metal speak to that topic through engravings, through uh, content of text, so that kids can come there and see the bugs, they can do rubbings of trilobites, they can see the emerging diversity, and we're working with the group to understand what is the reasonable limit. Obviously, we can't show every single bug that ever existed. What are the really cool ones? How big can we make them so that they really stand out and satisfy the broad interests of that faculty? Um, we all know that science is like with every other department, they, there are a lot of individual passions. We need to make sure that this ripple expresses enough of all those individual passions to be something that the whole community over there embraces. The um, DNA being the first one and evolving up to tetrapods, which is the uh, group that includes ourselves. In uh, bird's eye, <clears throat> The drop is um, sort of a reference to how you just put in that first moment, that drop of oxygen, that first breath of air, and out of that springs all of this life that we see on the planet and the biodiversity that um, at least once existed on our planet, even if we're doing our darndest to reduce that. And that's on the ground planes. You'll see in this side, there are two extrusions. Those come from a moment in time called the Cambrian explosion, which is of particular interest in this province be, as it relates to the emergence of life. There's a whole series of events that happened then that essentially allowed humans to come into being. This is the visual and physical pickup of the ribbon. So their content would be very similar to the other side. And it's that visual cue that these two different pieces are related to each other. We're looking at using some of the building columns in a subtle way to, I think the next slide shows it, um, donor appreciation, uh, directions on how these two elements work, um, all that sort of content that drives the connection between the museums and describes to the casual person how to use it, that would be discreetly uh, placed on those columns. One of the things that matters a lot to the user group is that uh, this is undercover. This is sort of the gathering place for the start of the tours, regardless of weather. So if it was raining like we've had the, earlier today, this is the place they would start and they could comfortably have that conversation. The speaker could stand in the middle and folks could stand around it. We've looked at the fire route and we've looked at path of travel between uh, the different buildings and across the campus. And certainly there would be some um, need for cooperation, particularly during COVID. But the, this introduction does not inhibit the day-to-day -day use of those buildings or of those spaces. In fact, it promotes interest and really drives people onto both sides. Um, there are technical issues in here like the trench drain, and we're working around those. <clears throat> you can see with this uh, image, it is still very much in progress. And there's also the hope that the um, indigenous storyline can be included within this piece as well. So working with Musqueam because of their relationship with the campus and understanding where in this element would be best suited to um, allow their storyline to be integrated because of course it's so fundamental to this part of the world. Knowing that the schedule of um, Indigenous engagement is often different from our very, very aggressive development timelines this allows that to evolve at its own pace. It allows it to 
have its own expression within the materiality and it can come in at any point that Musk William and the campus and the user groups feel comfortable with that content. So it unhitches them from our timeline, if you don't mind the word of the pun there, and to allow them to work on their own. Um, that's the concepts. If there were technical questions, we have those um, pages as well, but used up about a half an hour. So I'd like to open it up to comments and questions.